good morning. So, our topic for the day is Asian American literature uh, with particular reference to Asian American fiction or novels. So, uh, tell me what do you un understand when we I, when I say something like Asian American uh, you know a community. So, what comes to mind? Asian Good, Asian settled in America and who are those Asians? How do you define Asian-ness? Okay. Indians, Chinese, Koreans, who else? Okay, Indonesia, Japanese, okay, yeah, Vietnam, Philippines, okay, and uh, people who come um, from the South Asian part of the world, okay. So, uh, that includes Indians, Pakistanis, Nepalis, Bhutani, Sri Lanka, etc. Okay. So, this is Asian American. So, the, the scope is extremely vast. So, when we start talking about the construct, the idea of Asian American, then the it is not just Japanese and Chinese as it is uh, traditionally understood. Okay. It also encompasses several other nationalities. So, uh, it is extremely vast and you can see that all these communities when they come together, okay, it is not a very homogeneous group. Okay. So, that is the that is a quality of Asian American literature. Now, the key words that we are going to focus on um, are race, ethnicity, identity. Okay. What are the those tropes or marks of identities mm -hmm. that define this particular group called Asian Americans and even among Asian Americans there is no unity as we are going to see soon. Um, the ideas you know the efforts to assimilate and to integrate and to acculturate with the host country. So, this is also extremely important and it lies at the core of all Asian American literature the idea to get integrated and acculturated with the host country host culture. And of course, uh, actually this should come right at the top citizenship, okay. because citizenship at the beginning for these people, this community called Asian American was not uh, something easily accessible or available. So, we will begin with talking about the immigration process in America. I am going, I am taking you uh, very back in time, I am taking you to something uh, um, earlier part of the 20th century, last century. So, that is when the immigration process actually began. Okay, so, the idea of Asian Americans in um, Asian people in America is not very old, okay, just 100 years or so. Okay. So, um, America had a law called Naturalization Act, you should know that. Now, Naturalization Act What does it mean to you? If you are a, if you are born in America, you are an American, right? But if you are a naturalized American, what does how how does that happen? Good. You are born somewhere somewhere else in the world, but you are you become a naturalized citizenship. We also have something like this in India. Yeah, as far as I understand. So, this was an act which was in practice 1790, 1906. 1906, and uh, this was uh, a very interesting law 1790 to 1906, it uh, existed during that period, and it said that. Uh, only those people can be or can become naturalized citizens who were white people. Okay, so, now how do you define whiteness? Can anyone tell me what is white? Only whites can become uh, citizens perhaps, okay, but, but whiteness of skin was one of the uh, necessary factors. 
by 1917 something interesting happened. The United States of America barred entry to those people who came from the so called Asiatic region. That was in 1917, not so long ago. And then uh, <coughs> there is another interesting year, 1922 and 23, where there, there something very interesting happened. Two men of Asian descent in America, they uh, went to the Supreme Court in America and they had their cases heard regarding uh, citizenship. So, they wanted to become the so called naturalized citizens of America. So, um, one was Takio Ozawa, a man of Japanese descent. Now, his case was uh, the way he presented his case in front of uh, the US Supreme Court. He said that uh, uh, he has gone to the best of American schools and colleges, although he is a Japanese, but his family shifted and uh, he has been exposed to the, uh, to the uh, mainstream US culture and education. He also said that he is immersed in American culture. Now, this is also very important uh, when we talk about intercultural relationships, there is uh, an idea of immersion. Okay. Now, what do you understand? I mean, I would like to know your opinion on the definition of immersion. It is a very controversial topic, it is acculturation and immersion. What do you understand? I am immersed in American culture. And how do you become immersed in some culture? Exactly, you live, or you know, more or less it means that I am living the way uh, an average American, a general American would live. Okay. So, that becomes a very positive in your life. I mean, I do not know how many of us would be very proud to say that, that we are completely acculturated. I do not know what is, uh, it. Uh, this kind of position differs from person to person, would not it? What would you say? Okay, that uh, some people would like to maintain their racial identity, some people, uh, certain people would like to get immersed completely in the host culture. Now, uh, what would the native people prefer? What would the so called host country uh, people from here? Yeah, immersion. Okay, so, they do not want small pockets of uh, uh, you know, where people claim their racial identities. They want people who would be completely immersed. So, that is how. So, um, when Ozawa projected or uh, submitted his case before the Supreme Court in 1922, this was one of the um, defenses. Okay, this was one of the reasons uh, he put up before the court that he should be granted naturalized citizenship because he has immersed himself in the US culture, in the mainstream US cul culture. Then he gave evidence that he goes to uh, the American churches and not to any Japanese uh, place of uh, religion. So, that became one thing. So, when we are talking about what constitutes immersion, going to the, yeah, going to the places of uh, 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 religious ethnicity. Okay, so I, I, we go to the churches. Our family goes to the churches. Okay, our children go to American schools where English is the predominant language, and we have nothing to do with our own language and culture. So this was the way he presented his case before the court. He also said that we not only that. We also use English at home and we do not talk in Japanese at all. So, all these things are a big positive in our favor. The, he also produced alongside, he also produced sufficient evidence that uh, uh, culturally, culturally and socially he interacts more with the American people and he has successfully distanced himself from people of his own country, that is the uh, Japanese people in America. 
and um, I do not know what would be your feelings towards this, but his uh, lawyer also said that Ozawa should be granted citizenship because the color of his skin is white. Okay. He is whiter than most Europeans. You see, Europe also comprises several communities and several people. So, there are brown Europeans as well, exactly, Hispanics, okay, Puerto Ricans okay, in America. So, let us not talk, if you are now talking about Europe, then let us talk about South America. Okay. So, you have yeah, the people from Latin America and people from, uh, uh, you know, Brazil, all these countries, okay, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, Hispanic people, they are not really as white as um, an average American. But Ozawa was really white and he said, uh, the lawyer said that this makes for a case, very strong case. And what do you think would have been the verdict? No, not granted. <laughs> Okay, he was not granted the citizenship in spite of all this. Okay. Now, we will look at the second case. We were talking about two interesting cases for naturalized citizenship in America. And the second person was Bhagat Singh Tind from Punjab. Okay, and Bhagat Singh also applied. Also applied for citizenship, that is a naturalized citizenship during the same time period, 1922 and 23. And he made a strong case for himself. He said, that he has been to the University of Berkeley. Now, University of Berkeley is no ordinary university. Okay, it's one of the elitist uh, institutes of education in uh, America. Okay, another thing in his favor was that he had participated um, as a soldier of high rank in the First World War, and he had fought uh, from the side of the Allies. Okay. Then, now this is, yeah, in Ozawa's case, we saw that he made a case for himself on the basis of his skin color. Okay, I am very white, therefore I should be granted. Then said that he comes from a very upper caste, high class Hindu family, okay, Sikhs, uh, but Hindu, of course. So, I come from a very upper class Hindu family from Punjab in India. Okay, and therefore, I deserve uh, to be assimilated with the whites who are almost like uh, the high class people or high caste people in India. So, you see the analogy, the similarities, from, we are looking at the case from Thin's point of, point of view. What he, the, his case was that he is a, an upper class Hindu okay, and an upper class Hindu should be allowed to mix freely with the whites who are the upper class in America. So, he said that I am not like the poor black, I am not like the uh, your average Hispanic or Puerto Rican, you can uh, you know you, you cannot club me along with these people. Okay. I have by, uh, by reasons of my, by virtue of being a high class or high caste Hindu, okay, I have every uh, you know reason to hope to become assimilated with your culture. And I can trace uh, um, uh, you know, uh, my linguistic and physical and racial lineage to the so called Aryan community, okay, the Aryan ancestry. Who are the Aryans? Yes, Narain? When you, uh, you know, trace your lineage to the Aryans. Okay, what are you saying? Yes. Okay, so I can trace my ancestry to uh, European people because on virtue of being, uh, uh, you know, an upper class, upper caste Hindu. Okay, so I am, I can easily seek uh, 
alignment with the Caucasians, with the Europeans. Okay. And if citizenship can be granted to the white people, to the Europeans, then why not to me who can, who claims direct descent from the uh, um, Aryan lineage. And what was the result? The same as Ozawa, okay. no citizenship, no naturalized citizenship. Now, what do these two cases tell us? They tell us, they say a lot, but what uh, on the surface, what do they tell us? Okay. And like everybody can be an American citizen. Okay. And in general, how the American society is towards the marginalized community. Yeah. Their class concepts mm. and racial concepts. Yeah. So, fine. Uh, one is that uh, mm, the charm, the lure of being an American. Okay, on one hand, you have, uh, on the other hand, you have uh, the Americans resisting, yeah, uh, the, you, you know, the, the, this kind of uh, an encroachment on their territories. Okay, things are different now, but we will come to that. I am talking about uh, two major historical events. Okay, so things may be very different today, but there was a time when getting a citizenship was very uh, difficult and also the grounds on which citizenship was sought was also very interesting. People used to seek citizenship on the grounds of their skin color and their ancestry. Okay, now things are very different. Okay, and the, uh, naturally, the court denied citizenship to both these gentlemen. Now, we come down a few years. And then we see what happens. So, um, during the 40s, that is during the, uh, during the period of the Second World War, one was the fear of violence in America towards people of uh, Asian descent. Now, why do you think that uh, people of Asian descent would be uh, fearful of uh, violence against them? Exactly. So, the Japanese were the enemies okay, at that time. Japan was the enemy. Okay. And Asian Americans, especially from that part of the world, they look quite alike. You know, it is like you cannot distinguish between a person of Indian or Bangladeshi or uh, Pakistani birth. Okay. When we go outside to a European, to an American, we all look alike, do not we? Yeah even a person from Sri Lanka. Okay? So, most of us from this part of the world, we look alike. Likewise, people from Korea, from Vietnam, from Japan, from Chinese, okay? everyone was clubbed in the same category that this is the face of the enemy. So, all of them looked like Japanese to an average American eye and there was a lot of violence against them. Now, what happens when there is a violence against one section? of the community. We are talking about Asian American community. Japanese are the enemies, okay. but that also includes somehow um, Koreans, Vietnamese and uh, uh, Chinese are also dragged into that. What will happen? What would be their reaction? Protective or defensive? Take a guess. Would they be, yeah, they became extremely defensive. Okay. So, what they did was um, a complete disavowing of the Japanese people. So, this is an important term that you, you should know. A dis, the disavowal of the Japanese people by the Vietnamese, Koreans and Chinese people. Okay. Because uh, they did not want to get involved. Okay, uh, there were lots of racial attacks, physical attacks on them and they did not want to get in. So, uh, uh, the Japanese people were completely isolated during the time. Now, uh, there is a, cult a cultural practitioner, I am sure you have heard of this name, Raymond Williams. If you have not, then you should know 
Raymond Williams is a, a key cultural practitioner uh, of the last century. And he gives us a term called emergent cultural practices. Emergent cultural practices. Now, by emergent cultural practices, he means that when a society gives birth, gives rise to new structures, then uh, those new structures militate against the dominant structures present in the society. Okay, so, that is the idea. So, it is not a rebellion, it is not, a, it does not con, uh, constitute a rebellion against the dominant society. It becomes a very, according to Raymond Williams, a very legitimate narrative of identity and a sense of belonging. So, Raymond Williams idea of emergent cultural practices that uh, uh, whenever a group uh, is uh, uh, extremely dominant, there is always uh, uh, the birth of new structures, which in a way militate against the dominant groups. And it is not really a fight, okay? but it is a struggle to uh, make themselves visible and to make their legitimate narratives be heard. It is nothing but, you know, having a voice in a, you know, uh, uh, in a, in a culture which is dominated by um, the forces of majority. Okay, ask me any question if you have any, any at this point. So, we were talking about um, the cases of Ozawa and Bhagat Singh Tind. Okay, so, that was in 1922. Now, by 1960s, there was a change. I am um, sure you have heard of President Lyndon Johnson. Okay, who did he follow? President Kennedy. You know, he, he succeeded President uh, John F. Kennedy. So, President Lyndon Johnson. Now, in 1965, Lyndon Johnson's uh, Congress um, enacted and passed a law that uh, Selection of immigrants there hereafter will be based on. Okay, now, remember we were also talking about a period when naturalized citizenship was denied to people, people who were extremely, you know, um, eligible, okay, but they were denied. Um, then there was also a period when there was a total ban on the entry of people of uh, the Asiatic ori origin, okay, from the Asian parts of the world. Okay, we have seen that also. Now, during the reign of President Lyndon Johnson, the uh, Congress enacted a law, passed a law, which uh, uh, said that from here onwards, the uh, selection of immigration of or the immigrants will be based on three choices, three categories. One was uh, employment needs and preferences of the US. Second factor would be that would determine uh, the selection of immigrants would be family reunification. And third and most important, see first and uh, second are economics and social, uh, third was political, people who uh, flee communist countries. So, selection of immigrants would be based on the kind of profession you are in. For example, um, what kind of professions do you think, uh, I mean it has not changed much, okay. people especially in the science bracket, okay, um, they would be welcomed, okay, because that is what we need, uh, doctors and nurses, engineers perhaps, okay. but uh, not every profession. Uh, was you know peop uh, people from all kinds of professions it was not like that that they would be welcomed as well but particular you know um, uh, 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 experts or professionals in some some categories they were encouraged to come okay because that became 
the necessity for the American people. Perhaps they didn't have that kind of those kind of people they were looking for. Perhaps they, there was a scarcity of doctors and nurses. Perhaps there was a some kind of a positive for engineers. So, so you need them. So therefore, they will be given preferences. Second, family reunification. Husband has been working for a long time. Wife and children are back home. So naturally, you, they will be called and family is reunited. That also. So the citizenship would be based on uh, such factors as well. Third was people who are escaping the communist regimes and countries. Okay. So, uh, this is a vast area okay, we, that which we will look at when we look at a, uh, a couple of novels. Okay. So, um, that is important. Now, this immigration law transformed the um, uh, you know landscape of the USA. Because what would that, uh, what do you think would have happened once these, this kind of a law was introduced? See, these categories are fluid, right? You can make use of these uh, conditions and uh, find your way into the United States. So, earlier it was so difficult to find, uh, to gain employment or to get citizenship to get any sort of recognition. But now it seemed that uh, the USA had opened its doors. And so more and more people started going. So this is the period of the 60s. This is the 60s we are talking about. Okay? And uh, the, uh, I mean, this was the peak period when people of Asian origin started flowing into the US. And now, uh, because of their hard work, because of their professional qualifications and education and background, um, the Asians became a new kind of a role model in the USA. Okay. So, there are lots of reasons why they were welcomed, but this is also because they kind of liked being there and they also assimilated well there. Now, let us uh, consider a term like Asian American. So, the term itself was coined by someone called Yuji Ichioka. Yuji, Y U G I Ichioka, I C H I O K A. So, this is the man who first coined, who originated the term Asian American. Okay. And uh, this was uh, established, uh, this a center called Asian American uh, um, Center was established at UCLA, University of California, Berkeley in 1969. And, th and this man of Japanese origins was responsible for creating this particular center, Center for Asian American Studies. So, he was not just a great academician, he was also a social activist. And uh, uh, imagine we are talking about 1969. So, in American history, what does that remind you? What period was that? The late 60s. What was happening in America? Hmm? Yes, uh, Ravi? The civil rights movement. Civil rights movement. Okay, good. That is a good uh, example. Anything else? Counter -counter. Counter culture movement, yes. Yeah, good. The Vietnam War. Okay. So now, Ichioka was especially in interested in the counter culture movement as well as uh, in mobilizing student protest against the Vietnam War. You should remember that you know Asian American community itself was uh, such a minority that uh, uh, you know there was no way that they could have been very active in uh, uh, civil rights movements, okay, which was uh, dominated by the black people. Okay, so the, the black people had their own leaders, okay, they had their own religious affinities, 
Okay, so that was also a very distinctive group. Asian American community, on the other hand, they wanted to um, assimilate seamlessly and live very peacefully. Okay, so that was so they remained. They kept themselves um, quite uh, detached or distanced from uh, the black movement. But when the war against Vietnam started, when America was on the brink. With uh, the Vietnam, uh, with the war against Vietnam, then there was a sense of solidarity, and people like Ichioka, they organized student, uh, 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 mobilized student movements to protest against the Vietnam uh, war. Okay, so um, along with that, uh, Ichioka also helped in the formation of uh, a group called the Asian American. Political Alliance, AAPA, Asian American Political Alliance. Now, this was one of the first movements or one of the first efforts to give some kind of a political identity to this group called Asian Americans. Earlier, it was just like a struggle for survival a struggle for gaining recognition and acceptance and some um, you know to get rec uh, uh, acculturated and assimilated in the mainstream okay that was the idea but now they started behaving more and more like americans you know when you bomb, mo form political alliances and groups and launch protests against something which the go government is doing then that means the assimilation is more or less complete they started identifying themselves with the Mainstream, so they felt they had every right to do these things. Okay, earlier they wouldn't have. I mean, just think one or two decades earlier, they wouldn't have dreamt of doing or launching a you know very visible kind of protest against the government. They needed the government to give them the citizenship. But by the late 1960s, things started changing. Okay, now contrary to whatever Ichioka was doing, um, there was an American called. Todd Gitlin. Todd Gitlin in 1968, he gave us a term called days of rage, R A G E. And this term is uh, quite pivotal in the development of US cultural politics and political culture. And uh, people like uh, uh, Gitlin, they sort of you know contributed to the decline of the new left. However, there were other scholars who celebrate 1968, the year 1968 as a watershed year in the development of the historical self-consciousness among its white people, uh, among its non-white people. So, 1968 is a year of much political turmoil. On one hand, you had uh, people who were calling for going back to the old ways of life. On the other hand, you had the people from Asian American origins who wanted to assert their uh, identities okay, and their self consciousness. At the same time, uh, you know, you had uh, the president. Nixon. Now, uh, this is also a period politically, you had Nixon as the president. And how did he come uh, into ascendance? How, 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 how did uh, President Nixon come into prominence? What did he talk about? Now, we are not talking about his impeachment and Watergate, that happened later. But how did he? win the American people over? No idea. Okay. He won the election on the basis of a, a slogan called and this you will find very interesting, the silent majority. And who are the silent majority according to Nixon? The white people. They say we have become silent in, in our own country in spite of being uh, in majority. Okay. And why? Because you have Asian Americans 
asserting their dominance. You have the black people okay, uh, making their presence felt. And what happens to the majority? It has become silent. So, it was a very reactionary, very um, radical right wing kind of a you know political system that Nixon was endorsing. So, uh, Nixon's uh, political leadership in a way uh, caused the so called death of the new left. He embodied everything that was right wing. So, it was in during this period that we talk about people like Yuji Ishioka. So, people like Ishioka they were concerned let me get back to what I have what I have been saying all along. First concern was uh, the United States of America's involvement in Vietnam. Okay. Now, it was believed that uh, um, Vietnam was uh, an extremely weak country, a very poor country, one of the poorest countries in Asia at that time. And uh, uh, an attack on Vietnam caused uh, strong waves of sympathy among the people of Asian origins. Okay, that was one thing. And then there was a constant uh, intervention of the US in Asian territories. So, you think of uh, Pearl Harbor, okay, Second World War. Hmm? You also think of uh, uh, America's defense of uh, South Korea against North Korea. Okay, so, there were several conditions that uh, you know encouraged or promoted the birth of people like Ishioka and this uh, desire to create a distinct political identity, okay, uh, you know a cultural identity like uh, Asian Americans. So, they needed there was a need to assert themselves, because they felt that US is getting too imperialistic, US is getting too domineering and interfering too much and there is a need to stop them. Okay. So, uh, Ichioka and his uh, groups they uh, created and uh, um, uh, groups and Asian American groups particularly there were debates there were classroom discussions and from classrooms they came out in the streets and they were the people who uh, organized several war rallies, the so called anti war rallies in America. So, it all began with this, the creation of uh, the Asian American Center at UCLA. Now, what was happening in to literature all this while? We started the class talking about Asian American literature and then we talked about citizenship and race and political identities. Now, um, uh, a very interesting uh, uh, development was happening during the uh, uh, you know uh, middle part of the last century as far as literature was concerned, literature of Asia, uh, writings by the Asian American people. Now, there is one uh, autobiography called um, fifth, the fifth Chinese daughter, which was published in 1945. The fifth Chinese daughter published in 1945 by a woman writer Jade Snow Wong. Now, uh, the um, novel published in 1945 it gained instant acclaim because the author talks about accepting Americanism as a way of life, as the only way of life. And what she uh, 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 argued for was that uh, um, the Americans and the American culture is an extremely benign culture and the, um, the only way one can find true happiness in America is by uh, you know completely immersing ourselves in the American mainstream culture. So, that was the fifth Chinese daughter okay. and uh, US government was naturally very happy, extremely pleased 
with the publication of this novel and uh, in order to promote this kind of writing they got it translated in several languages of the world and distributed it all across uh, the world you know and it was a best seller and um, the US government also encouraged uh, Miss Wong, Jade Snow Wong to travel to uh, major Asian countries you know now we have writers traveling far and wide for book promotional activities so that is what this so she was one of the first uh, you know literary person to be sponsored by the government okay to go on a book promotional uh, visit uh, you know promote promoting the book because they were so happy with the kind of contents and with the especially the kind of ideology that the book was um, promoting okay and uh, um, america used that book as a document to um, uh, illustrate how well they treat their racial minorities so it's just a myth that there is racism in america you see we have an author an, an author of asian american descent who is writing her autobiography where she praises the treatment of the minorities at the hands of um, the american people and american government in particular then uh, there was another author called uh, um, a japanese author this time um, daniel okimoto daniel okimoto o k i m o t o who wrote another, um, an autobiography called an american in disguise it was published in 1971 and this is another extension of the fifth chinese daughter where the writer claims an affinity between uh, japanese americans and the white americans so there, there are lot of things which are common between us and therefore the only way we can seek harmony is by living peacefully together and by assimilating ourselves completely into uh, the american culture and this book also became a major best seller now uh, something else happened at the same time there was a writer called frank chin frank chin c h i n and he despised writers like jade snow wong and daniel okimoto uh, okimoto for writing books of such uh, you know which were so clearly propagandist in nature so accommodative in nature and he deeply resented the ideology the ideological contents of these books so frank chin felt that there was a deep chasm between america's claim to democracy and its imperial march through asia so uh, frank chin wrote a seminal essay called 50 years of our whole race w h o l e whole race 50 years of our whole race which was published in 1974 yeah. 50 years of our whole race is an essay um and it was published in an anthology of asian american writings asian american writers an anthology of asian american writers first book of its kind published in 1974 and this is what it's called 
I do not know how to pronounce it. Yes. So, it has a, a couple of vowels running through it. It is called IE uh, Anthology of Asian American Writers, edited by Frank Chin, who contributed the seminal essay, 50 Years of Our Whole Race. He challenges the notion of, um, you know, which has been popularized by the Americans. Uh, that uh, um, Asian Americans suffer from this uh, dual identity complex. He said that people, um, uh, Asian Americans are actually treated badly and they are treated as emasculated citizens, you know, who are, you know, in popular culture you must have come across this term called little yellow man. You know, the, um, the Chinese are treated like as if they do not have any courage or strength or anything, they do not know how to talk, they do not know how to, in, uh, you know, they, they are not familiar with the sophisticated way of life. Okay? So, he criticized and condemned um, the popular American notions which supported such beliefs. He also lashes out against the white American supremacy in this essay and he presents his culture, the Asian American culture as being extremely and this is this has come uh, become another very controversial idea asian american is promoted the culture is promoted as extremely masculine and heteronormative i'll read you uh, an extract and that will give you the idea of what is masculine according to Frank Chin. Language is the medium of culture and the people's sensibility, including the style of manhood. Language coheres the people into a community by organizing and codifying the symbols of the people's common experience. Stern the tongue and you have lobbed off the culture and sensibility. On the simplest level, a man in any culture speaks for himself. Without a language of his own, he is no longer a man. So, look at the repetitious use of man. Okay? So, Asian culture is masculine culture and Asian men are highly masculine as well as heteronormative. And remember, this comes in the wake of the famous Stonewall Geroids. Do you know this, that particular incident? You did counterculture movement. Are you aware of this? Stonewall gay rights. Okay, there, um, there was a, a, a police raid um, in a gay club called Stonewall Inn in uh, New York City. And uh, uh, because there was a raid, the gay people fought back. So, it is famously known in history as Stonewall writes. Okay. But uh, it is not to say that there, were, there are no gays in uh, uh, the Asian American community, but they were not accepting. The Asian Americans were highly reluctant to accept or admit to the presence of these people, the gay people in their community. So, the idea was to project themselves as highly, highly heterosexual and highly masculine. Okay, we will continue with the uh, lecture in next class. Thank you so much.